Good morning. How are you? Good. You look and sound great. Get your Bibles out. Go to Acts chapter 15. Um, next week, right here, we're going to have a chance to pray over those guys before they head back to Prague. It's going to be an honor to do that. And this, this morning, it's interesting because we're going to look at the connection, a direct connection between the very first missions uh, outreach, if you can you know, kind of qualify that from Acts chapter 13, when the missionaries, when Paul and Barnabas were sent out. Now, we recognize that wasn't the first time missions was being done, but it's kind of the formal beginning when we see someone sent out. And what we want to do this morning when we hit Acts chapter 15 is we want to get a complete picture, a complete picture of why the mission was done in the first place and that is going to be a lesson to us as to why all missions are done, okay? So this is not on missions, this is about mission. Okay, so don't get confused with the title missions. Don't think foreign, overseas, think every believer on mission somewhere. Okay, we've had guys that have headed to, south to Houston as the church, as Sherman Bible. That's different than us getting up here and banging a drum and, and, and figuring out how quickly can we jump into that mess. It's rather, it's believers saying, we're going to pack some trailers, we're going to head that way with water, head that way with our boats, we're going to do this. Can you guys help us a little financially? Absolutely, here's what we want to do, right? But it's believers leaning into that for a specific purpose. And just to let you know where we stand with the events that have happened with the hurricane, we're waiting to find out where we can best settle in to help a local body help local people. Because right now, the chaos, we don't want to just throw, you know, hurl resources into it. We want to be targeted in that. Things are getting done, and we're going to update you as we go along. Okay, so Acts chapter 15, if you got that open. Last week, we actually started Acts chapter 13. Okay, now we're skipping... Basically, the narrative, we're going to skip over the narrative of what happened, and we're going to have a synopsis of it, of what happens in Acts chapter 13 and Acts chapter 14. Basically, Paul and Barnabas go out. They spend two years traveling. They go to a very few places by our, you know, kind of our normal modes of travel. If you spent two years on an airplane, you could see the entire world seven to, uh, several times over. They got 1,250 so miles, okay? They did a lot of walking, so they, it's not like they were, you know, catching a missions plane. They were on boats, and they were spending time preaching the gospel in some places, and of course, you know, getting stoned. That was, no, being stoned, because getting stoned, you don't want to say. First service, you won't laugh much at that. That won't work at second service. They're getting stoned. No, the, going out, being abused. But let me just tell you the, the overall arching report of what came back at the end of the first mission's journey. There was one main topic, and it was this. The Gentiles are saved by faith. The Gentiles have the Holy Spirit. Now, we always already saw when Peter goes, he goes to Cornelius' house, they get the report that that's happening. But now it becomes confirmed through sent out men from Antioch who go and spend two years and come back and say, it's the Gentiles. In fact, in chapter 13 is where Paul gets, finally, he has enough, and he says, enough with the focus on the Jews, where from now on we're going to the, to the Gentiles. Now, he still reaches out to the, to the Jews, he still goes to the synagogue, but his emphasis becomes, there are those who've never heard, let's go tell them. And that journey he comes back with, I want you to see in the report, the basics of what is the gospel. Still for us, Still today, it's not just what saves, it's what sanctifies. The way in is the way on, okay? And so the end of Acts chapter 14, let's read the verses and let's just see. There's just four verses, 24, actually five verses, we'll starting verse 24. So Paul and Barnabas have gone out in ministry, they've done ministry, they've started churches. Verse 24 says they passed through uh, Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. All right, they're coming home. This is the return trip. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, watch, they declared all that God had done with them and, or namely, how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. 
That was the main report. As they're headed home, this is the main report. The big announcement is this. The Gentiles are coming into the kingdom. How are they coming into the kingdom? They're hearing the word preached, and they're believing on Jesus for the remission of their sins, and to back it up, to validate it, and to affirm it, they're receiving the Holy Spirit. This was huge news. No Jew in, in the history of the Jews ever had a paradigm that would fit this. This was messing everybody up. The Gentiles were sometimes referred to as dogs. They weren't highly esteemed people. Okay. So as we, as we go into, into Acts chapter 15, I'm going to look through the text, but I, I have three points, okay? Uh, really? You ready? Some of you are just excited about that. It's like, yes, life. Okay, three points. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you all three points up front. I'm just going to say them. I'm going to discuss them for here for a moment. We're going to go through the text, and then I'm going to say them at the end. That's the message. Three points. I'm going to go through the text. I'm going to say the points at the end. They're very simple. Here is the first point. Point number one. You have zero self-righteousness. Zero. See, capital zero. You, you, and that's me, you and I, we have zero self-righteousness. Now, when I say that, maybe you're thinking, well, I know some self-righteous people. Right. But the reason why they're so, you know, annoying and pathetic is because we know that's fake. Right? A self-righteous person is annoying, right? And when you're a believer, they're also pathetic. Why? Because we know it's not true based upon God's word. You have no self-righteousness. Now, when I say that, I get what we hear. We're not righteous enough to approach God. That's not what I said. And that's not what the scripture affirms. The scripture doesn't affirm that you didn't just quite not have enough. The scripture affirms you have none. That your righteousness, my righteousness, in and of ourselves, born in sin, is like filthy rags. There's filth on all of our righteous works, and they're all tainted, they're all a mess. So you have no self-righteousness. Now, it's easy to say that when you talk about 100%. But maybe there's a Pharisee in your head. Maybe there's a Pharisee in my head. So we're going we're gonna to poke at the Pharisees a little bit here in a moment. But I'm not so much worried about the external Pharisees right now as I am the internal one, Right? Because you may have an internal Pharisee, and your internal Pharisee might tell you, oh yeah, you're not really, you're not really good enough to get to God, but you weren't all that bad. You're not Hitler. Wow, that's a great way to compare yourself, isn't it? It's like the Dallas Cowboys. Well, at least they didn't come in last. We had to live like that for a while. Anyway, you're not, are you 50% righteous, you think, maybe? Who? Okay, let's, let's, be, let's be realistic. What if about 10%? 10%? Are you 10, do you have 10% righteousness? Ask yourself, do you believe? Let me ask it this way. Do you have 2% righteousness? Just two, just that little squeak. And let me tell you this, that 2% coming to the understanding that you don't even bring 2%, that you don't bring 1%, you don't bring a half percent, you don't bring a fraction of a percent into the relationship, you bring no righteousness, completely changes your walk with Jesus Christ. Because he now becomes more valuable when you realize your value is only in him. And that brings us to the second point. Point number two. God's righteousness is yours only by faith in Jesus Christ. His righteousness is yours only by faith. There's not a work you can do. There's not a way you can drum it up. This is actually what separates Christianity from every other religion in the world. And when I say Christianity, I mean the biblical Christianity, not some title. I mean, orthodox, the, the apostles' doctrine, if you will, what we see taught and preached in the scriptures, okay? That you don't have a work, but every other religion is about you working out your salvation in a way that you can please God and be saved. The working out that we have is one of sanctification and cooperation in falling deeper in love, our heart transformed, loving him, and that's spilling over to good works. One is root, the other is the fruit. Christianity is the only religion, if you will, hate to call it that, where God does the work, man gets the benefit. Every other religion, every other religion is a religion of works where you please God or the gods, and thereby you're accepted. Let me say the point again. God's righteousness is yours only, by faith in Jesus Christ. You did not earn it. You didn't qualify it. And listen to me, you can't keep it. 
Your works don't keep your righteousness. They don't. They, biblically, they are a fruit of your righteousness. It's you living out who God has really made you. And here's the third point. Jesus plus anything equals nothing. Jesus plus anything equals nothing. So if Jesus is your righteousness, as, listen, as soon as you, for righteousness sake, try to add something to that, so that you're righteous, it's Jesus plus my little trinket, it's Jesus plus my little ceremony, it's Jesus plus my circumcision, or my keeping the law, or my systematic theology, or my THD, or my many do's and don'ts, don't smoke, don't drink, don't chew, don't go with those who do, I got all that going, and therefore I'm righteous, then you have nothing in Christ. I'm going to show you this from the Bible. So here we go. This is pizza time, right? Here comes the pizza. If you're new, we don't really serve pizza. What, the, the illustration is very simple. I didn't cook this stuff. I'm just the delivery boy. That's all I'm doing is delivery. And these three points are explicit in the gospel. And let me just say it to you this way. These three points, in essence, of what the Gentiles received and therefore proved to the Jews how they were saved is the whole point of the book of Acts. It was certainly the point of the first missionary journey without question. But the whole book of Acts is a demonstration. God birthing his church for his glory, calling the, the, the chosen to him, calling the people of God to him, giving them his spirit, irregardless of their heritage or their works. They couldn't earn it. He paid for it on the cross. So here's where we see it, and I want you to see the battle that keeps us from walking in it. Because here's the problem. If you think you earned it, you're going to think you've got to keep earning it. You're going to think, well, I've got to keep the plates spinning. I've got I to keep things juggling. I need to maintain this thing so that God stays happy with me. And we learned in 18 weeks going through the book of Galatians that intimacy is a result of security. And if you don't realize you're loved by God and that he paid the price completely for you, what will you do? You will shrink back. You will push away if and when you sin instead of pressing into him. See, the place to deal with sin is in the Father's lap. The place to come and, and, and handle stress and brokenness in your life is not away from God. That's old school. That's Adam. That's fig leaf. It's to come right into his presence boldly, find help and grace to help in time of need, the scripture says. So let's do this. Acts chapter 15 and verse 1. Got to talk fast so you got to listen fast, okay? Acts chapter 15, verse 1. Remember, he's given them a report. It says they stayed there for a while. They've been, in, they've been hanging out in Antioch, and here's what happens. No good deed goes unpunished. Here we go. Everything's great at church until... But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers. Now let me make a couple statements. Some men... It doesn't say brothers. It says they were teaching brothers. It says some men. And it says they came down from Judea. Now Paul addressed these, and we talked about these in our 18 weeks in Galatians. These were the Judaizers. These were men who claimed to have been sent from James and the apostles, and they were not. Therefore, they were not only liars. They were what the Bible calls hypocritical liars. Okay? They come into the church, and they begin to teach something. Now, that's very dangerous. Why? Well, we need to know those who labor among us. You don't want just anybody pouring, you know, what they purport to be facts into your head. In fact, that includes me. Can I just let you know this? Don't take my word for any of this. Go and open your Bible. Read it for yourself. See if these things are so. Check it out. You don't need to take someone's word. God wants to deal with you directly through the Holy Spirit. This form of teaching, corporate, edifying, it's building up, yes, but you're to go and you're to confirm this yourself. These men were coming and they were teaching what Paul would later call a different or other gospel. So they came from Judea teaching the brothers. Here's what they're teaching. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Okay, so I want you to see this. It's Jesus plus circumcision. In this circumstance, it's Jesus plus circumcision. So you can hear the word of God, you can believe the word of God, you can confess that you believe on Christ is your atonement, he's the Lamb of God, I believe he's Messiah, but if you don't get the surgery, no. Which, as a side note, what would you do if you're a woman? That's what I was thinking. That's what you were thinking. Yeah, that would make it incredibly difficult. 
But that's what they're teaching. They're teaching this. It's Jesus plus something. And what was the third point? Jesus plus anything equals nothing. Now the scripture says they had, you know, they, they go into this. Look at Galatians chapter 2. 4 and 5, it says, yet because of false brethren, this is Paul later referring to this, yet because of false brothers, these men, secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so they might bring us into slavery. You see that? Here's what I want you to hear. Anything you're adding to faith in Christ, you're putting yourself in bondage. You're locking your hands tied. You're putting yourself in a place where you're going, I'm going to try to fulfill the impossible. And what is that? I'm going to try to bring my own righteousness before God. I need to impress him. I'm sorry. Good luck won't help you. You're not going to be the first who does it. No one has ever been able to. Jesus Christ, act of obedience and substitutionary death burial, resurrection, that fulfilled the law and bought for us forgiveness of sins, justification, he was raised for that. You cannot earn this. See? So what do you do? You put yourself in a bondage. It's a state of impossibility is what this is inferring. They slipped in to do that. Verse 5 says, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. You know, we're doing an explicit gospel class. Many of you signed up for it. We, we had 40 spots in the 10 o'clock, and they immediately filled. So we opened another one at 11 o'clock, and it immediately filled. Because people are saying this, show me clearly, help me get it, that I understand the explicit gospel, the gospel purely discussed, purely described, purely preached, purely written about. I want the real thing. Paul was saying this, if we put up with them, the gospel wouldn't be pure. Whatever it is you're adding, it's an additive. The gospel doesn't need it. In fact, It begins to take away from it as soon as it's introduced. He said, we didn't yield in submission even for a moment. Acts 15, go back back there. We're going to stay in Acts 15. Look at verse 2. It said, and after Paul and Barnabas, I love this wording, had no small dissension and debate with them. You ever had a no small dissentious debate with your wife, guys? (laughs) This morning. (laughs) Kids are like, what are you all yelling about? Well, we had no small dissension in debate. <laughs> That's a polite word of saying they were fighting with them. And if you don't think Paul was capable of that, go back and see how he spoke to Elemus the magician. You son of the devil, you perverter of all things straight and true. Yeah, they, you know, he, he, he let him have it. And he was dealing here with men who were perverting the gospel, which was the only thing Paul cared about. Do you understand? It's the only thing he cared about. Everything else he did, everything else he suffered, everything else he would provide, whether it was building a tent, offering a drink of water, whatever the mission was, it was only for one purpose. It was for the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's all it is. If you think you're in a mission and you're not doing that, you're just, you have an activity, okay? Because that's what the mission's for. The gospel is the power of God to salvation, So they have no small dissension and debate. Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles uh, and the elders about this question. In other words, let's get the guys together. Let's go back to the home base. Let's talk to the guys who are the apostles who have been with the Lord the entire time. Paul was an apostle. But he's, he's encountering this and it's so new that what the Judaizers are saying sounds good. By the way, if you're going to add something to the gospel in front of a Jew, circumcision would be the perfect choice. I mean, because it would be the thing that made sense, right? They didn't say abstain from this or abstain from that. They simply said, just had circumcision and everything would be okay. Here's the problem with that. The law never stops. Once it ekes in, in bondage, it never stops. Why? Because the law of God is perfect, absolutely perfect. It will always have a further demand. So they head that way. Now, Paul, referencing these guys, listen to this, Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. He's referencing these men. Now think about no small dissension in debate. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. Strong language. Just in case, you know, <clears throat> someone might later with you know, a theological degree decide to try to untie that. Theological degrees are great unless you use them without the understanding of Scripture and through the Holy Spirit, which is what people do. They they start undoing the Bible and they say, well, it doesn't really mean what it says. 
Oh, thank you. You're so smart. You've been here 50 years. You're able to undo what it says. Appreciate that. He says it again. As we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, let him be accursed. Let him be removed. Let him be thrown out. Let him be hell bound. That's what it means. So when he's dealing with these men, he's not dealing gently. Can I just suggest this to you? You need to deal the same way with the Pharisee in your head. When thoughts come up, I don't know if I've earned it. You haven't. Well, I don't know if I'm worthy. You're not. Well, I don't know if I stand before him. What, what My works, what will my work? That, you need to deal with that in your thinking. And you need to say it somehow to yourself. I'm not going to hear that. He alone is my only righteous plea. He is my only plea before a righteous God is the blood of his son Jesus. That's it. This is the whole purpose of the mission. This is why they're doing what they're doing. This actually is the story of us. Galatians 5, 1 through 4 says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. There's that bondage again. Think about it. The the yoke of slavery. Going into something that holds you captive. And I, I can't tell you how many Christians I've known. I know you know them. And sometimes it's me. And it's probably sometimes it's you. Because you have a little legalistic thing that you feel like if you can hit. And all it does is rob your devotion from shamelessly approaching the throne of God. Loving on Jesus and doing those things that stir up your devotion and your love for him. And by the way, that's how sin is put out. That's how sanctification takes place. The more you love, the more you want to be like him. It's not standing far away and going, I'm a worm, I'm groveling, I wish I could keep it. This is the fear. No, the fear of the Lord is the dread that you can't and you approach him based upon the atonement. That's how a man's heart is changed. And you look up a year later maybe and you say, I don't don't know what it is. My heart has changed. I, I no longer see myself doing blankety blank. You're not going to get there in bondage. You're going to get there in freedom. He changes the heart. He made us free. He adopted us as children. It's a whole different gospel. He says, don't become entangled with the yoke of slavery again. He said, look, I, Paul, say to you, check it out. Now watch this. This is in your Bible, that if you accept circumcision, that doesn't mean if you're circumcised. That means if you accept it for the purpose of righteousness before God, Christ will be of no advantage to you. Jesus plus anything equals nothing. There it is. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. Wow. Wow. Have you read the law? You might want to read it again. Well, I just want a little bit of law. Mm, No, it doesn't work that way. It's like lava, baby. The least bit comes in, it blows out the doors, and it gets where it's going. It stops, it hardens, it takes a jackhammer to get it out. That's what it's like. You don't just get a little bit of law. Here's the question. Do you have a little bit of law playing around in the mission? Do you have a little bit of law playing around in your own sanctification, in your walk with Christ? Is there a Pharisee in your head? Are you keeping a list? When you come into worship, are you asking yourself, let me see, let me check the sin list. Hey, I've done pretty good. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You know, next week you check the list, not so good. Okay, half mass. You know, I can. You completely blow it. You don't come to church, right? Not you, your first service. This is for the body of Christ at large. Are you keeping track? The scripture says that if if God were to mark our transgressions, that means to X them. No one would stand. You couldn't stand before him. He's chosen to erase the document that was written against you. Nailing it, the scripture says, to the cross. It's either true or it isn't. You're betting eternity on this decision, right? He says, if you put it somewhere else, Christ is of no benefit to you. Testify again, verse 3. Every man who accepts, accepts circumcision, again, is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. That doesn't mean the moment you stumble, God goes, oh, you're done, you're under law, blah, blah, blah. you know, goodbye. I'm done with you. That, what that means is that if that is your ongoing pattern and you believe you're bringing this to the table, it's Jesus plus this. I'm telling you, that is not the verbiage of a born-again child of God. It's not. 
And that's counterintuitive because we think, we, well, surely we've got to bring something to the deal. I mean, you get in a real estate deal, you, you bring money and then they bring the house, right? There's a trade-off. So you, we, we think in terms of equality and equity. There is none of that in terms of the atonement. God did it and you get the benefit. It's a gift. Savvy? Anybody in here got grandkids for service? I know you got grandkids. Do you give a, grand, do you give a gift to your grandkids and go, all right, I need you to pay 30%. Go sell some Legos, lemonade, beg, pay. No, you give a gift and you say, here, I want to bless you because I love you. You don't owe me anything. It's a free gift. That's the nature of the free gift. Those things call you up and they say, hey, come on to this resort and we're going to give you our sales pitch and you'll receive a free gift. No, you paid a day of your life. (laughs) Back to Acts 15, verse 3. So being sent on their way, now they're going to head to Jerusalem, being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria. Watch this, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles. It's the topic. And brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers, now watch, this is a different verb. This is a different, rather, noun. This is a different noun. This is a different word. Some believers who belong to the party of the, of the Pharisees, rose up. Okay, now get this. This doesn't mean they're false brethren. This means they're believers in Christ, but they're just, the men, they're in a paradigm. Guys, they, they, they grew up with this. Some of you, you grew up with it. By grace through faith is like weird to you. You think, surely it can't be that easy. And you're here at Sherman Bible, you're here in the gospel, maybe you've been sitting under it for a whole year, and you're going, I'm finally starting to believe this might actually be that good news. It is, it's true. You don't bring anything else, but it's a struggle. Has anybody else ever experienced that? I grew up Catholic. I was beaten by nuns, but I learned to read really well. You know? I always think, it's, there's got to be something. I mean, my confession has to be right, or isn't there a beat, or isn't there a this, and the e pluribus unum. Something's got to happen. No. But I have to actively go, no, I'm not going to be that. That doesn't mean these guys weren't believers. It says they were some uh, believers, some believers who belonged to the party of the circumcision, or rather, party of the Pharisees, same thing, rose up and said, watch the difference. It is necessary to circumcise them in order for them to keep the law of Moses. It doesn't say so they can be saved. What they're saying is, Surely they have to be good people. That's how we would put it. The typical evangelical will say it this way. Well, you can't just tell them they're saved without doing anything. There'll be anarchy. People be immoral everywhere. Axe murderers, bank robbers, all going, I I know Jesus. No, listen, if that's your view of grace, you don't understand it. When a heart is changed, the beauty of the gospel is it changes the heart that you don't want to do that anymore. That becomes the battle. You know, I didn't have a battle with sin before I got saved. There was no battle. I was in cooperation fully. <laughs> Look what Carlin said. I, I was not experimenting with drugs. I was in a full-scale research. I was pushing my chips in. I got born again, and now the battle comes, see? They're just saying, surely there have to be these things. I mean, you got, surely there's got to be some therapeutic, moralistic deism. Surely God will make them have a different haircut. Oh, gross. When you're sanctified, you wear a tie, y'all. See, you see how easy it is here, fam? Listen, you see how easy it is. To just go, that doesn't seem religious. That just seems kind of common sense. I mean, we want to, ugh, that's the Pharisee. Good works are the fruit, not the root. Come on, we got to make them do this. Keep the law of Moses and the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. I want you to notice something. They don't just stand up and go, that's ridiculous. They had to weigh it out, man. That's how new this is. So they're going to. They're going to have the discussion, verse, verse 7 of Acts 15. And after there had been much debate, there we go again, Peter stood up and said, here we go. Brothers, 
You know that in the early days, it would be about nine years before this, nine or ten years earlier, remember Cornelius, God made a choice among you that by my mouth the believers should, watch, hear the word of God or hear the word of the gospel and believe. They'd hear the word and they would believe. And you remember, they heard the word, they believed, and the Lord gave them the Holy Spirit in a manifestation that would prove for that time, very importantly, that these were a people who belonged to God. He gave them the same outpouring as they had in Acts chapter 2. Same thing. So what Peter's saying is, this is the way it's been. You guys, have you guys forgotten this is what happened? And so when Paul, in writing uh, Galatians, look, chapter 2, I know a lot of you love this verse. Think of it in context. He says, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh. That means living just outwardly. It doesn't mean sinful flesh. That means just outwardly. The life that I'm now doing and I'm walking around, I live I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In other words, the way I got in is the way I now walk. I didn't come in through grace, by grace through faith. I didn't hear the word of God and believe, and now that I'm in, I need to get some good law on me. And you've seen this. If you've been around church, maybe not this one. I've just, if you've been around religion for enough years, you've seen the, the kind of the methods by which we start kind of saddling people with new things. Now, this doesn't mean you go out and you make a confession, I'm a believer in Christ, and I'm going to live immorally. The Scripture's very clear about that. But what it says is, those who are going to struggle, we're going to walk with. Those who are going to go headlong, we're going to say your confession isn't true. Right? Wrong? Struggle's one thing, headlong is another. If you just say, hey, I slipped my hand up, so now I can do whatever I want. We know that's not a believer, because there's been a heart change. You come to Christ and then you say, I'm in the struggle, I'm in the battle. Hey, we're in it with you. But he's saying, the life I now live, I, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. It didn't, it didn't change the moment I was born again. Verse 21, I do not nullify the grace of God. What does that mean? Here it is. Here it is. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Why did he die if he didn't die to save me? If it comes through the law, Jesus' substitutionary death was pointless. So Peter's still giving the testimony, Acts 15 again, verse 8. And he says, in God, who knows the heart, he knows whether or not a person is born again or not, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now here's the interesting thing that's happening not only are the Gentiles beginning to uh, have acceptance among the Jews as by grace through faith, but the Jews are now learning, oh, this is how we came in too. You see, it was easy for them to think, well, yes, he saved me. I mean, of course, I'm a circumcised Pharisee. He would, wouldn't he? He'd want me. I'm, I'm an asset. You know, what can I say? He chose well. Right? Isn't that what religious pride is? Isn't that what humanism is? It's kind of saying, you know what I brought to the table, God really looked down and he liked, and therefore he chose me. Mm, no, scripture is opposite of that. It says he chose you despite you. Same way he chose Israel. Always a picture. Aren't you glad? If you didn't earn it, you can't have to keep it. You get to relax and rest in it and then walk with him. And love gets to be the, the impetus to change your heart further and further, more and more, glory to glory. And they're starting to go, wait a minute, we didn't earn it. Oh, we didn't earn it. See, the problem with humanism, the problem with self-righteousness, is it always ends in one of two things, doesn't it? You're either going to end up condemned because you messed up, or you're going to end up congratulating yourself, aren't you? You're going to end up thinking, oh, man, I nailed it, so I'm better than everybody, or I blew it, and I'm a worm. There's never a balanced walk. And by the way, if you're walking in condemnation, or if you're walking in you know, uh, pride of thinking you nailed it, both are humanistic. Our hope is all in Jesus Christ. That's how Paul could say in Romans 8, 1, there's therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ. That's how. Not because of what we did. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it makes it really clear. It's always been this way. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. Now, now let's give them a break. They didn't have the book of Ephesians yet. 
This is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, so that no one can say when they get to heaven, nailed it. I've been nailing it since I was 19. Did you see me? I crushed it. I was killing it. People were looking at me like, dude, you're going to live forever. I was like, probably. No, there's no high five section in heaven. Everyone takes the crown and throws it at the feet. Why? You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. It's always been this way. It's always been this way. It's, this is not a new New Testament thing. Genesis 15, 4 through 6, when he speaks to Abraham, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This is the man, or this man will not be your heir. Speaking about Ishmael, your very own son will be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. This is a guy that didn't have any kids. He had one through his maid. Her name was Hagar. That's not a good deal. If your name's Hagar, hey, hope you're a dude. Verse 6 says, and he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. There it is. Righteousness through faith. Now that was based on, right, that was based on debit. It couldn't be based on credit. The, the crucifixion hadn't happened yet, but it would be. That was counted as righteousness. Romans 4, 2 through 5, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. If you go to work and you get your paycheck, do you go into your boss and be like, I just want to thank you. This is the most amazing gift. I, I, I don't know what to say. It's like every week you just decide to gift me money. No, you earned it. That's not a gift. Salvation is a gift. His wages are not counted as a gift, but, it, but as his due. Verse 5, into the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Same thing in Galatians 3, chapter, five, or chapter 3, verse 5. Does he who supplies you by the Spirit, or supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, do so by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness, know then it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Back to Acts 15. Peter says this. Now therefore, Why? I love the question. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test? Why? You know what that means? That means to provoke the Lord. Why would this be tempting the Lord to anger? Think about that. Here's the answer. Because it's removing the hope of salvation. But the, the question's interesting. Now, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Why are they doing that? Well, first of all, why does it make God mad? Matthew 23, 13 answers it. Jesus says this, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the door of the kingdom in people's faces, right? You make it complicated. For you neither enter yourselves nor allow those to enter who would go in. See, you shut not only you, but others out. You block the way. That makes God mad. You want to make God mad? Get between him and the one he's after. Be like getting between a man and his wife. If you can hear the illustration there, it's true. You're headed for trouble. Why would they do that? Why would they do such a thing? The answer is completely clear. It's true for the Pharisee. It's true for the Judaizer. It's true for the religious Pharisee inside of my head. And inside of your head, here's the answer. Galatians 6, in two verses, here it is. 6, 12 through 13. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh. Who would force you to be circumcised. And only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ or after their own ease. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law. But they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. They want to go, look, look who I wanted. Look at these nice religious little products I produced. That's not the true gospel, is it? It's not. Verse 11, Acts 15, closing here. But we believe that we will be saved, or that, they, that we believe we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. And all the assembly fell silent and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, brothers, listen to me. 
Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take for them, from them a people for his name. And with this, uh, the words of the prophets agree, just as is written. He quotes Amos right here. After this, I will return, I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen, I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those Gentiles who turn to God. He gives them a few things after that. He gives them four things not to do in the context of their old idol worship so that they're not offending those who would come to Christ in the synagogue. But here's what he's saying. Don't trouble these guys. It's by grace through faith. Number one, you have zero self-righteousness. I love the way Matt says it. You're free to be the failure that you are. Number two, God's righteousness is yours only by faith in Jesus Christ. Only. Jesus plus anything equals nothing. I want to ask the band to come back up. We want to apply this. I want to sing this one time out. But before that, I want to, I want to pray for you. And I want us just to say, Holy Spirit, show me the Pharisee. If it's in my head, is there something that tries to keep me under a law without just resting in your finished work? Father, I pray for our hearts right now, Lord. Just, just as we see your word, and it presses in on us, Lord. Right here this morning, Lord, we want to say that we want to be given to the simplicity of devotion to Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that the atonement was enough. We don't bring a piece of it with it. We trust in it fully. We have no self-righteousness, and all of our righteousness from you is in Christ by faith. And Lord, we come to add nothing to it. I pray that you'd show us any way, right now, Lord, any way that we try to bolster it or make it sufficient enough instead of just resting in it. Lord, thank you again for the finished work of Jesus Christ. Let's stand together and let's sing this before we go.